How does it feel to be back in Ohio? I like Ohio. Very green, very pretty. We are in Fairview Park, Ohio, looking into the mysterious 2007 death of Gwen Bewley. She was a very active, healthy 67-year-old woman. She's the kind of lady that I want to be when I'm her age. From what I'm reading, she was a pretty snappy lady, wasn't she? A spunky thing. <laughs> she liked roller skating and just totally carefree. You gotta love it at that age. She seemed like the kind of lady that walked around making friends with everybody. Mm -hmm. Gwen went to a roller skating lesson, came home, and shortly after that, a neighbor smelled smoke and reported the fire. 911, what's your emergency? Where at? Running from the new school? He's on his way. When the fire department arrived, they discovered Gwen's body lying on the kitchen floor. Her remains were so badly burned, she was unrecognizable. This is a different kind of case. Fire creates a problem for us. It There's complicates things. Absolutely. Investigators suspected that Gwen's death was murder, using arson to cover it up. But fire always creates a challenge forensically. It destroys evidence, and in this case, critical clues as to how Gwen died. It's one of the reasons why this case remains unsolved. In the world of prosecution, the number one controversial issue is arson cases. In a lot of cases, at least back home, have been reversed. Arson cases are the trickiest of all because it is a science. So we're going to have to go over all the evidence with a fine-tooth comb in order to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this wasn't just the case of a little old lady who died in a tragic accident. It's been 16 years and still no the police consider her killing a cold case. Years later, the case is still unsolved. There are so many cold cases out there just waiting to be solved. The crime scene ultimately tells the story of the murder. We want to bring justice to these victims. Nice to meet nice you. Hi, Callie. Nice, nice to meet you, finally. Thank you. Eric Upperman, nice to meet you. Were y'all all here in 07 yeah. when this happened? In fact, took the phone call. I took the call. Paul and I were on the same shift. I was a shift commander at the time on the 3 to 11 shift. The case has worked beautifully. We'll hopefully make it even stronger this week, so let's all get to work. <laughs> Very good. All right, Chief, thank you, sir. We both have put a lot of time and effort into this case, and I just hope working with Yolanda and Kelly, we can get over that hurdle to at least bring that to a closure for the police department as well as the city. Hey. Hello, ladies. What's up, Mr. Allen Brown? How's everybody? This week, we're bringing in Allen Brown because we don't have a lot of witnesses in this case, so we need to get all the information out of them that we can, and Allen is as skilled an interrogator as anybody. Tell them how many murders y'all have here in Fairview Park, Ohio. About uh, one every 10 years. And so it's one of those things where you can drive through the city, I remember this crime, I yeah. remember this crime. OK, y'all want to start by talking about our victim? That's a great picture, Paul. How'd you get that? Uh, from the family. Look, Yolanda, Red Hat Club. Love it. They're kind of known as being vivacious and lively and spunky. Oh, she fit that bill. She lived life to the fullest. Gwen was a mother, a grandmother. She was a free spirit, liked to have a lot of fun. If it felt good, she did it. Paul, you want to start by telling us about the case the day of? On August 29, 2007, around 4.45 p.m., we received a 911 phone call of smoke coming out along the roof line of a house. 316, can you see flames? As I approached the house, a neighbor, Scott Shaleen, came out, and there was a car in the driveway. And I said, whose car is that? And he goes, oh my god, that's Gwen's car. So I went around and we had to retreat because of the heat. That bad? Yes. She was 67. How do we know that she didn't just fall and hit her head? Well, initially, that's what we all assumed. Uh, however, the autopsy showed something different. The coroner's report showed no signs of carbon monoxide or soot in Gwen's lungs, indicating that she was dead before the fire started. But we're still going to need to show that her death was not an accident. With arson, that's always the first hurdle to overcome. The arson actually complicates a lot of things, what injury she sustained, and then any evidence surrounding her. Thank goodness the fire marshal said, hey, you know, we're going to handle it like it's a homicide. We're going to need to meet with the fire marshal in this case. He's the one who investigated the arson, and if this case goes to trial, 
not only is his investigation critical, but the way he conducted it is going to be held to the highest standards to show that this is a homicide. Who do y'all want to put up first on our suspect board? I think that'd be Scott, Shalina. Scott, her next door neighbor. For four, four years. years. Can't we say they were friends? Yeah, neighbor, friends. Anything about his prior criminal history that we care about? He has assault. He has some drug possessions, fraud, passive bad checks. Scott said that I had a VA appointment. I took a bus. I got home around 4 o'clock. I smelled smoke. I checked my house. When investigators first arrived at the scene, Scott Shalene acted as a helpful neighbor, answering questions about Gwen's home to assist the rescue effort. But once the murder investigation began, he started to look a little suspicious. Scott's home right at the time of the fire. Well, he said he smells it. He, he smells, starts looking yeah, he in his it. own home. In Scott's initial statement, he stated that he smelled smoke, but never saw any signs of the fire from his house. It seems odd that he wouldn't go check on his neighbor that he supposedly had a really close relationship with. Okay, who else do we have? That'd be Timothy Shalene. Tim Shalene is Scott Shalene's brother who had recently moved into the neighborhood to live with his brother, and he had developed a friendship with Gwen. How would you describe his relationship with Gwen? What would you call it? You could call him friends. She trusted him enough that, that she allowed him to make financial decisions. It was a fairly new relationship. He, he'd he'd only, only been there since May. Only three months old? Yes. Yeah. He's the last one to see her. Last one to see her at home. And where the crime occurred, he was the last one to see her. On the day of the murder, Tim had lunch with Gwen and left her house around 1245. He said he then borrowed Gwen's rental car and made a two-hour trip to Michigan, which means he was nowhere near Gwen's house that afternoon. OK, so do we want to go to his list of crimes that are pertinent now? Forgery, fraud crimes. Conan. A lot of fraud. Now, after her death, I mean, he's caught with her things. Credit cards and a rental car. She allowed Tim to use that car to go on his new job. To go to Michigan and come back. Yes, sir. One week after Gwen's death, Tim was pulled over for driving her rental car and arrested for unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. Police recovered some of Gwen's property inside that car, including three credit cards that Tim had been using that belonged to Gwen, as well as a laptop. Tim was allowed to borrow Gwen's car when she was alive and maybe even her credit cards because he was her financial advisor. But using those credit cards after her death isn't just suspicious, it's also a crime that he actually served time for. Well, since y'all have so few murder cases, then you're not used to having to present it to the DA's office to convince them because you don't go do it that no. often. Okay. In anticipation of you going down to talk to the prosecutors about this case, all these little things that, that we're making you say to us, those are all the things that are very important for you to sell the case. Right. By the time we get done, you're going to teach you how to argue back and be rude. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot to do. We've got to show beyond a reasonable doubt that Gwen's death was no accident and also that the fire marshal's investigation is going to hold up the trial. And we've also got the Shaleen brothers to deal with. They both knew the victim. They both lived near the victim. So we have to figure out whether either one of them could have been involved. I could be a small town girl. I know you don't think that, but I maybe could be. Teach you how to work in the concession stand, Ooh. play bingo. I think it's a kind of a great homey feeling. Hi. Today we're going to meet one of Gwen's daughters. Her name is Sue. We want to get to know her mom through her to make sure that we all have a clear understanding of Gwen's world. Tell us about your mom. She was my children's last surviving grandparent. She was very vivacious. She went roller skating. She was on a golfing league. She didn't sit still. She was like a hurricane. <laughs> like Really skating? <laughs> That's something at 67. Yeah. She loved life, and she uh, lived it to the fullest that she, you know, I guess the other part of that, though, is that she's open to making new friends with even people that maybe she not, might not ought to make friends with, huh? You know, I never thought I'd have to worry about her because she was so independent. And in Fairview Park, we didn't think you had to worry about anybody there. You thought you could pretty much trust most people, yeah. especially neighbors yeah. and stuff. And... and she just always said, oh, they're so helpful, they're so friendly. But I would say she was a bit too vulnerable for her own good. I understand you've won every case that you've pursued. <laughs> You must have some really good instincts. You know, no, you, you know what it is? It's, it's all this. It's being prepared, and it's checking out every single thing we can find, and it's a team effort. We're going to do everything that we can, and let's just hope that just enough changes this week to make it finally happen. I pray to God that they can uh, do what they came here to do and make a difference for my mom's case. It was very nice to meet you. Come here and give me a hug. Mm -hmm. 
first order of investigation on this case is to examine the crime scene. So we're heading to Gwen's house to get a better understanding of the layout and what happened that day. Fortunately, Fire Marshal Frank Reitmeyer has agreed to join us and help. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good, morning. good, good. Hey, Frank. Good morning. Good morning. That's where Scott and Tim lived. I pulled my cruiser up here. Scott came running out. And when I asked whose car is that, that's when he said, oh, that's Gwen's car. Gwen must be inside the house. Was the fence here for, yes, for yes. Scott to be able to see over? That, that fence was there. OK. I got to be honest, I did not realize how close Scott and Tim's house was to Gwen's. It makes you think, how could Scott not know that Gwen's house was burning when it was only 20 feet away? We're hoping that a look inside of Gwen's house will tell us a little more. Right here. We're in Fairview Park, Ohio, looking into the death of 67-year-old Gwen Buley, whose burned body was found in her home seven years ago. Right here. Oh, wow. It's different from what it was. Fire Marshal Frank Reitmeyer investigated the scene that day and is going to walk us through what he discovered. My she would have been were, right here. Yeah, so her feet were right here. And her head would have been over here. So you can see it's almost like voids on the floor right here where she was because her body's flat against the floor and it's not getting burned. When there's a dead body at the scene of a fire, it's crucial to investigate it like a homicide since you only get one shot to preserve potential evidence. Fortunately, Frank Reitmeyer did just that. It's his analysis that will hopefully show us this fire was an arson and not just a little old lady who had an accident. Frank, talk about all the things that contributed to the fire on her and around her. You have to define an area of origin before you can define a cause. And it was very clear that the room of origin was the kitchen. In determining whether or not a fire is a case of arson, investigators first have to rule out any electrical malfunctions or fire hazards that could have been the source. So we know there's no shorts. We know that it didn't actually start by anything on top of the stove that she was cooking. Looking at the patterns on the remaining materials that were here, the, the stove, the walls, the cabinets, the, the body, the floor, the ceiling. Now I'm down to her body as being the area of fire origin. So the fire started here, and it grows up and out, and then it impinged upon the ceiling and burnt through the ceiling. Fire requires three things to make it work, heat, fuel, and oxygen. In this case, debris on Gwen's body was ignited and acted as fuel. A nearby cold air return vent supplied the oxygen to the fire. And as the heat intensified, the flames crept up to the ceiling and continued to spread throughout the house. What are all the factors uh, that go into your being able to voice an opinion as to how she wasn't just an old lady who fell and hit her head and died that way? Finding the bits and pieces of the burnt paper and the cardboard and whatever on top of her just helped to uh, verify that easily combustible materials were placed on top of her and then ignited. Well, and I mean, if she had fallen, you know, hit her head like they talked and fallen and, and then subsequently died, how does she get all this stuff on top of her? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. You're not going to have a bunch of debris on top of you. Well, and then how it becomes, how does it become ignited? So your opinion is somebody put stuff on her and then set That's it on fire? That's absolutely my opinion. She was dead before the fire of unnatural causes, and then the fire covering up, you know, the homicide. What's your theory as to how it happens with our suspect? Well, I think that the suspect was here, and they got into a confrontation of some type. I mean, she didn't lock the door behind her very easily. Could have just come right through the door. I don't think she saw what was coming. They might have just grabbed her, started suffocating her or choking her. She's in the kitchen doing her thing. Yeah, I come up behind, lock it in. Before she can even do anything, I have her down on the ground, or I just lock her out, choke, smother, I leave. Frank, from what I can see in the pictures, and you were there, it looks like the highest concentration of burn on her body is definitely all of her face, her neck area, into this portion of her torso, and her left arm is almost burned off. It's possible the suspect focused on burning Gwen's head and neck to try and cover up injuries she sustained during a confrontation. The saddest part about all this, though, is that we're standing right here in this nice, cute, little safe kitchen in Fairview Park, Ohio, a nice, safe town, and her kids think their mom is safe, and she thinks she's safe, and look what happens. The scenario that the fire marshal played out makes perfect sense. That, plus the evidence he discovered, is going to be crucial in showing the county prosecutor and hopefully a jury one day that, beyond a reasonable doubt, Gwen was murdered and arson was used to cover it up. Are y'all ready to go? Yeah. yeah. Okay.
Now that we have a clearer picture of how the murder occurred, we need to put together a timeline for that day. This is Kelly. Kelly's hi, gonna, hi. Uh, nice to meet you. Gwen's friend, Lynn Marie Malak, talked to her that day at 2.08 p.m. That is the last time we can say for sure that Gwen was alive. On the day of the fire, uh, you had a phone conversation with her. We made arrangements for the next day, but she wasn't sure, like it wasn't completed. And okay. it's she, she said, I think I, I think I remember her saying that she had to go. Why'd she have to go? I kind of got the impression that somebody was at the door. So she ended the conversation as if she had to go talk to somebody else. Right. Can or do you? something else at that time. But it wasn't the typical, okay, well, nice to talk to you. It was a little more hurried. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Gwen hurried off the phone at 2.08 p.m. And at 4.45 p.m., neighbors called in reporting a fire at her house. So we know that her murder had to have occurred in this window. But that's a pretty big window, so we need to try and narrow that down to the most precise time possible. That's going to help us compare Scott and Tim's alibis. That's right. Over here? Nope, gonna go take, her, take her right. Jeffrey Kendall was stuck in traffic that very afternoon in front of Gwen's house. He may be able to help us. I just seen this gentleman walk across, went up the porch, didn't knock, just walked in the house. You remember what time it was about? Oh, yeah, because I get off at 3 30, so it take me no more than 10 minutes. It must have been 3 40 to 3 45. Jeffrey Kendall could be a key witness in this case, and if he saw Gwen's killer outside of her house at 3.40 p.m., that could really help us narrow down this time window. I'm not sure if there's another gentleman out. I don't, there might have been somebody else out in the front. I'm a little, I'm not sure if he came out of the house or he was already in front of the house. I, I, I'm having a strong sense he was already in front of the house. And there was if you don't remember, then, you know, yeah. don't guess. Just... No, I'm not, but... Yeah, I think they were both standing there. But the second person, I have no vague of what he looked like or whatever. I believe there's a truck in there. Yeah, a Ford. Jeffrey Kendall's heart's in the right place, and I think he wants to help. But when you look at his initial statement, and then you look at the following interviews, and, and there's little things added because he's watched the news footage or gone back by the house. And now it seems like he's confused and he can't speak to actually what he saw that day. He's not as good of a witness now than he was back then. All, all he's good for is the time. The 3.30 is a That's all we want night. him to say today was 3.30. Then he came out with all that other stuff. I'd never heard that until today. You can't pick and choose what you like and what you don't like from a witness. There's about one a case that tries to get too helpful. Yep. And then they do, and then you're done. Because everything he just said is impeachable cross-examination, so there's no point. He's toast. Our two suspects in the 2007 murder of Gwen Bewley are her neighbors, Tim and Scott Shaleen. Hey, Miss Arthur, how you doing? I'm Alan Brown. We're just kind of going back over everything and making a push to try to clear it. Good. In order for us to get a better understanding of Gwen's true relationship with those brothers, we're going to talk to one of her closest friends, Pat Arthur. Describe Gwen for us. Oh, God. She trusted everybody. This is what this irritated me that she got with these guys next door to her because she let him go and help her with finances because she said they were you know, the people that work with money management like. When you say that they dealt in financial things, management or whatever, like an actual professional financial. Well, that's what it sounded like, she thought. Do you think it was both the guys next door, or do you think it was just the one guy? One was only living there by himself for a while, but I think the other one came into play somewhere along the way. OK, when he was living there by himself, did she ever talk about him managing her money? You know, I don't think so. She's saying up until Tim came to town, she wasn't even talking about Scott. Absolutely, yeah. She had gotten that computer, and he was using it. He was supposed to show her how to use it, because she didn't really know how to use the computer. And did that ever happen that you know of? Not that I know of. I don't know if she ever got that computer back after they had it. That computer Pat mentioned has got to be the same computer that Tim had in Gwen's rental car when he was arrested, and the police seized it. The strange thing about that is, shortly after Tim's arrest, Scott Shaleen started calling the police, claiming it was his computer. 
Officer Shepard? Yes, sir. Scott Shalane again. What's up? I had some of my personal belongings in that car. What is it? Um, I had a laptop. Well, right now we're inventorying everything. Do you have the receipt for the laptop? No, I don't. How much did you pay for it? Um, I don't remember. Okay, well, if, go ahead and look for the receipt. If you bring it up, we'll release it to you tonight. That's not a problem. I, I just don't want it lost. That's the computer Scott said was his, but it's really going to be Gwen. But we never gave it to him. The question here is, why is Scott claiming that's his computer, and why is he so desperate to get it back? We're going to need much stronger evidence to prove if Tim or Scott were involved with Gwen's murder. It's time to take a deeper look on where they were on the day she was killed. Scott has always maintained that he had an appointment at the VA at around 2.30, and then took the bus home, where he was for a short time before he started smelling smoke. Tim claimed after having lunch with Gwen, he left for a new job in Michigan at 12.45. At the DA's office, we worked with a guy named Eric Devlin, who's also a part of our team, who's now a computer forensic specialist. He is a geek tech freak. What's exciting is that since this crime has happened so recently, we can use cell phone records to analyze Tim and Scott's movements. We brought in Eric Devlin, a digital forensics expert, to see if they're telling the truth. Now, a cell phone is constantly letting the towers know, here's where I am, here's where I am. That's what's called pinging it. Every time that you request data, well, that's where you get the tower locations of where you are, the longitude and latitude. On August 29, 2007, Tim Sheline's cell phone makes a call at 1.43 p.m. That is in the general vicinity of Miss Bewley's home. In his words, he was on his way to Michigan or in Michigan. At that, at that time. time. At that time. Because mm -hmm. he said he left at 12.45. And that's what? 1.43. 1.43. So that's an hour after he's claiming he left. Tim did not leave for Michigan when he said he did, so he's either confused or he's lying. But then again, at 1.43 p.m., we do know that Gwen was still alive. At 2.33, Tim Sheline receives a, a cell phone call from Scott Sheline's cell phone number. And again, Tim's phone is within a mile and a half of Gwen Bewley's home. So Scott's calling Tim at 2.33. Correct. We can say for sure that they are not together because Tim's phone is hitting right. That's the point. from the house 16 miles away. Scott's phone is making a call or receiving a call from Tim's phone. We have two important things happening with this 2.33 phone call between Scott and Tim. First, it shows that Tim is still not on his way to Michigan. And second, Scott is near the VA building where he says he was. And we know at this point that Gwen had hurried off her phone for some unknown reason. Then you actually have a fairly large gap. There's two other calls, but they don't hit a tower. Right. Tim Sheline's phone, phone does not pick up the call. It goes to voicemail or hung up before voicemail. That's why I do not get a cell tower. We have a whole hour in there. Tim is not picking up the phone. A whole hour from 2.56 to 3.52. But, but he's making a ton of calls before. At the time of the fire, nothing's going on. God, that, that matches perfectly. It's not just the answered calls that tell a story. It's also the unanswered calls. Because what's going on in the world of your suspect when he's not answering his phone? Correct. Next call was a call that was made from Tim Sheline's phone number at 4 or 5 p.m. Now, what's the distance from the house? About three miles. Everything's hitting the tower at the house. Now, at 4 or 5, he's three miles away, and people are smelling smoke. A cell tower is an eyewitness. It's on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So you can see that cell phone in Tim Shalene's pocket never left Ohio. So why was Tim Shalene lying and saying he was in Michigan? And what was he doing there so close to her house during all this time when he said he left at 1245? Now that we know Tim lied about his alibi the day of Gwen's murder, it's time for us to figure out more about him. We know that Tim was caught using Gwen's credit cards after her death. He went to jail for that. But it's important for us to know whether or not Tim was taking advantage of Gwen before her death as well. So we pulled up Gwen and Tim's financial records. 3-11-30, Tim Shaleen. That's Correct. Tim's, that's that prepaid credit card. One month before Gwen's murder, Tim loaded $311.30 on his prepaid credit card. On that very same day, Gwen's credit card was charged for that same amount. This clearly shows us that Tim was not only stealing Gwen's money after her death, but also before. That is a huge piece of this puzzle. On 
it's refunded back. And she's on to it. So not only do we know that Tim was stealing, more importantly, Gwen became aware of it and protested the fraudulent charge a week and a half later, causing the money to be credited to her account. How can we prove that Tim knew Gwen was protesting? So he transferred the money, then all of a sudden it's gone. What happened to it? He knows that she knows something funky's happening with her credit cards. You can't stand up in front of a jury and argue, well, this is, we all know that's what he did. If Tim was stealing Gwen's money and she found out about that and protested it, there's his motive. But if he wasn't aware of her protesting the charges, we can't establish that he had a motive to want to kill her. Well, if 660 still existed, we could get it all. They don't. They don't. So how do we get it in? If we can't put a custodian of the records on the stand to justify the paperwork, the papers themselves are hearsay. So not only do we have to find evidence that Tim knew he was caught, but it has to be evidence that a witness can testify to in order for it to be admissible in the courtroom. So we have a problem. We have to prove that Tim knew the world was crumbling. How are you going to prove it? I'm trying to figure out how we're going to prove it. Gwen's laptop, which Tim used to help her with her financial records and which was seized by the police, might be the answer. Get the computer, because that could be the key to the whole thing. When it was initially searched, nothing pertinent was found. But we're keeping our fingers crossed because Eric Devlin has this brand new imaging technology. We're going to be able to uncover that link that can prove what could have been Tim's motivation. It's all yours. Hi, Scott. Hi, how are you? I need to talk to you for a second. Is that okay? That's fine. I appreciate it. While Eric is working on the laptop, we need to talk to Scott Shalene. It's just suspicious that he was only 20 feet away while Gwen's house was burning down and he did nothing. Add to that the fact that he was so persistent in wanting to get that laptop back out of the police custody, and it just makes you think that there's something wrong. Before you came, came back home, what did you do that day? I had a VA appointment, okay. then, then came back. So you had been home for how long prior to the fire? Uh, I'd say I drank like half a beer when I started okay. smelling it. And then somebody came to my door and said, hey, there's a fire next door. I remember that weekend when I checked on you and I talked to you that you felt somewhat responsible for her death. Well, I, I felt because I smelled the smoke. OK. Um, and, and that's where I felt guilty. Up until the fire, you didn't know Gwen was dead. No. Okay. This is where you need to be honest, and this is where you need to be truthful, Scott, okay? Remember I seized the laptop that night when we arrested him? Was that your computer, or was no, it? that was his computer. Okay, so that was not yours? No. Okay. That computer that was Tim's was actually Gwen's? Wow. Yeah. Did you know that before, no. Scott? No. Okay. And then you get to the credit cards. So that's what I understand why, why she would get more than one. And, and you had to have asked your brother at some point in the last seven years, why did you have her credit cards and what did he tell you? He, I didn't charge that much on them. That's what he said, I didn't charge that much on them. Yeah. But why did he have them in the first place? He, he didn't answer that question. Scott actually seems very believable and he also seems truly surprised that that laptop was not his brother's. But until Eric is completely done processing that laptop and we know what all is on it, we can't cross him off the board. Hi, this is Detective Harrington from Fairview Park Police Department. How are you? Good. We know that Tim Shalene was stealing from Gwen before and after her death, but it's still a big leap to go from con man to killer. We need to talk to some of the women in Tim's life so we can have a better understanding of what kind of man he is and what he's all about. What was your relationship with Tim? A uh, working relationship. He took pictures and stuff for like glamour shots and then I did the makeup and stuff. It just got really, really bizarre. What did you mean like that the relationship was bizarre? Like in the phone calls he was telling me that he loved me, you know, wanted to be more than friends. I mean, he told me he was going to kill me and my kids. If you didn't date him, then he threatened to kill you? Yeah. Did you guys ever go out? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. How many times? After two or three times, I just didn't have a good feeling. So then he wasn't really nice about me telling him I wasn't interested. Was he belligerent? Belligerent, yes. He got nasty. He, he got nasty. Yeah. Something's wrong with him. He's nuts. He's not who he says he is. He is the most manipulating person I've ever met in my life. Scared the daylights out of me. Can you give us some examples? I mean, this one particular time, I just had enough and he threw me to the floor, and he ended up biting my arm, and I was screaming. 
and got him off of me, called the police, and he went to jail. And there he was knocking on my door the next day. That's the way he was. He was a stalker. He said, it's like the devil gets a hold of you, and he's smarter and wiser than you, and you, you can't win. This case went from being a puzzle and a cold case as a challenge to very, very scary. And this might be the worst guy that we've chased, seriously. Hi, this is Detective Harrington. Hey, folks, I don't mean to interrupt, but I managed to finish the computer and I actually found something you may want to see. The evidence is mounting against Tim Shalane for the murder of 67-year-old Gwen Bewley. But our case still hinges on finding evidence that proves that he was aware of the fact that Gwen had caught him stealing. So we're not looking for computer records that say, I'm, I'm planning on killing Gwen. We just want him looking at 660 rewards before the murder, and then everything is nice and pretty and you can make it work. Verification records more than anything. Exactly. We've talked to all the witnesses. We've examined all the evidence. Our last hope is that laptop computer. And Eric Devlin says that he might have found something. Hi, sunshine. Good morning. We hope you're tired. I am very tired. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to finish the computer this morning about 3.30. Oh, wow. So I actually extracted the hard drive from the computer, created a, a good forensic image. It's exactly what you're going to want when you actually bring, bring it into court. We have got to find information on this computer to show that Tim Shalane was aware Gwen Bewley protested his charges because that would threaten to send him back to prison. What I was able to find was that on August 16th, this computer accesses the Reward 660 site. And not just the site, it actually accesses a member site. Basically, you had to use a username and login. That comes back to Tim's accounts. And 12 more times he checks on his computer this account. So you got it before his, her murder, and it's in his possession. Okay. We know that on August 8th, Gwen protested a charge on her credit card. And it's the same amount that had previously funded Tim Shalene's Reward 660 account. Now we can show that Tim Shalene knew about that protest because he logged on to that 660 account several times, including the morning of Gwen's murder, with his own password and email account on Gwen's computer, which was recovered from his car the day he was arrested seven years ago. Oh, it's so sweet how things work out. He's checking all right around coming up to the time of the murder. Then he goes over to her house and has a friendly lunch. Mm -hmm. That's good. That I somehow don't think was so friendly by the time it was all said and done. Rebuilding the web pages is one of the most difficult things. It's advantage of literally the latest bit of technology. I can tell you that the stuff I was able to find isn't anything that their experts would have been able to find at the time they examined this computer. The software program I used, this version was actually released less than a month ago. A month old technology allows us to say for sure that Reward 660 happened. And yeah. you'll come back and testify for these guys if they go to trial. Yes, ma'am. Uh, happy to do it, do it all the time. Perfect. Perfect. You're worth a penny. <laughs> <laughs> Tim's world was crumbling around him, and now not only do we have the evidence to prove it, we have somebody who can testify to it. Yay, well, I'm glad you're a nerd, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. With all the information we have that points to Tim Shalene, it's time for us to figure out what to do with his brother, Scott. What are your feelings about Scott Shalene, Paul? I don't believe Scott had uh, anything to do with her homicide or, or the fire. And his reactions to the fire and her death is not one of a guilty guy right. at all. You felt somewhat responsible for her death. Well, I, I felt because I smelled the smoke. Okay. Um, and, and that's where I felt guilty. Scott was Gwen's neighbor for four years and never had any issues or problems with her until his brother showed up. The cell phone records confirm Scott's alibi and show us that he was miles away from Tim at the time of the murder. After talking to Scott, his story is still the same and he seems to be truly upset about what happened to Gwen. Taking all that into consideration, we are very confident that Scott Shalene had nothing to do with Gwen Bewley's murder. I think that you're not just taking him off the board, you're not just checking off a to-do for your prosecutor, you're making him a key witness against his own brother. And he's gonna be a good witness. Now that Scott Shalane has been cleared after all these years, it is time to confront Tim Shalane.
this is it. I mean, this is the whole part of the plan you've been waiting for. Tim is still on parole for being convicted of being in possession of Gwen's rental car and also being in possession of her credit cards. He has a meeting with his parole officer today, so Paul has arranged that he be held at the office and we're gonna go down there to approach him. Once he's off probation or parole, he uh, he can go anywhere in the country he wants. He's, he has nothing to bind him. Yep. So this is why time really is of the essence. Yes. He hasn't he hasn't shown up yet. What? Paul just got a call. Tim has not shown up for his appointment. You think he's left town? If he didn't show up there, he's gone. We're on our way to surprise Tim Shalene at his meeting with his parole officer. The problem is he hasn't shown up for the meeting. Yes, sir. He's in the lobby now. I'm on my way up there. All right, thank you. You're gonna talk to him? She definitely won't tell you, talk to me. All right, let's go. Tim? There's a lot of questions you could answer. Uh, no, you're trying to get me to incriminate yourself. I'm trying to get you to answer our questions. You know something? I can't do that. Why don't you refocus on her daughters? Her greedy daughters that wanted her money. That's who you think did it? Yes. That's a mean man. He's got the coldest, meanest looking blue eyes I've seen on a person in a long, long time. He might not be real big, but he's a really scary man. We can't force him to talk to us, but that's okay because cold cases aren't usually solved by confessions. It's always all the little pieces and inconsistencies like the ones we've learned about this week. How do you feel about your case now? Question that they've always asked us every time we try and take this to them is, is there anything new? Well, now we do have things that are new. We were able to show beyond a reasonable doubt that Gwen was murdered and this fire was an act of arson. She was dead before the fire of not unnatural causes, then the fire covering up the homicide. By using cell phone records, we were able to show that Tim lied about his whereabouts on the day of the murder. It states that he is in Michigan. Tim's phone is within a mile and a half of Gwen Bewley's home. And Tim was not answering his phone during the window of time that we believe Gwen was murdered. We have a whole hour in there. Tim is not picking up the phone. Add that to Tim's crazy history of violence toward women. It's like the devil gets a hold of you and you can't win. He got nasty. He, he got nasty. Yeah. If you didn't date him, then he threatened to kill you. Yeah. This guy is not going to leave women alone. And lastly, with the use of state-of-the-art computer forensics, we were able to show that Tim knew Gwen caught him stealing her money. On August 16th is the first time he checks on this computer, this account. Then he goes over to her house and has a friendly lunch. You can see every bit of this story laid out before your eyes. You're there. Are you ready to take it to your prosecutor? He's ready. All right, let's go. Okay. We'll let y'all know as soon as we're here. Keep your fingers crossed. Kelly and Paul are presenting the case to the county prosecutor, and as always, anticipation is killing us. All of the hard work put into this case over all these years is finally coming to this moment. All right, all right. Tommy, you got it. You got it? You got it. All right, thank you. After seven years, they've agreed to take it to the grand jury, and I'm very happy about that. We put a great deal of effort in, and now we have reached the goal. That's a really good feeling for me. We summarized it, and the DA was very impressed. Paul has never presented a murder case to a prosecutor before, and he did his presentation like an old pro. I'm so proud of Paul. Really helped us organize, brought up new information, stuff we didn't have before, so wow. really there were no holes. Let us know if you need anything else. All right, Kelly. Okay. Okay. And we're going to go tell Sue the good news. Yes. All right. well, thank you. All right. Good. good. We're doing that. We'll She'll be we'll so excited. Part. Okay. It is so incredible to be able to tell Gwen's daughters this news. Hello, ladies. Hi. Good to see you again. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay. How are you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. After seven long years, they're finally going to have answers as to who's responsible for the murder of their mother. Well, we are very excited to tell you that after all these years, the county prosecutor is going to present a case against Tim Shalene for the murder of your mother. It's a good day. It's a good case. And you should love Paul Shepard and Tom Harrington. It's taken seven years, and I'm grateful that Kelly and Yolanda have gotten us where we are now. I really hope that my mom knows we didn't give up until we got to this point. My mother didn't deserve to die like that, and I, she needs justice. We need closure, and I want this man put away. Thank you for taking my mother's case. It was an honor to work for y'all and to get somewhere with your case. I knew in my heart that there would be justice at some point. It's just a good feeling to move forward. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. So Paul Paul, he's, he's waiting to talk to you. I'm so glad you came so we could give you good news in person. Gwen Bewley was the kind of lady that was the life of the party, the one everybody wanted to hang with. You can feel that spirit in her daughters and it's that spirit that made them never give up in getting the person who murdered their mom held responsible.